Good evening, and thank you for joining tonight's Telephone Town Hall, hosted by the Jefferson County Board of Commissioners. I'm Roger, and I'll be your moderator tonight as we have a conversation with Commissioners Andy Kerr, Leslie Dahlkemper, and Tracy Kraft-Tharp about Jefferson County's funding challenges. Before we begin, we want to invite you to start submitting questions early about the budget. What are the things you'd like to get out of tonight's meeting? Are there specific topics or questions about how the budget works, TABOR, or county revenue that you want to be sure we answer for you. You can submit those by pressing star three on your telephone. Now we realize that some of you just want to listen in, that's fine, but again, if you do have a question, press star three anytime during the call, you'll be transferred to an operator who will take down some basic information. Once the operator notes your information, you will be returned to the call and can listen to the conversation until you are called upon to ask your question. So go ahead and press star three now if you already know your question, and this is the same process to follow throughout the call. If you hear something that generates a question, just press star three. You can also view an online presentation during the call. If that is something that interests you, simply go to our Telephone Town Hall webpage at www.jeffco.us forward slash town hall and click on the link for the webinar. We'll take just a moment for each commissioner to give a short introduction before we jump into our topics. First, I'd like to turn this call over to Commissioner and Chair of the Board, Andy Kerr. Commissioner, go ahead. Thank you, Roger. I'm Andy Kerr, and I represent District 2 on the Jeffco Board of County Commissioners. District 2 includes uh, most of Lakewood and Golden, uh, a part of Evergreen, and most of the central part of Jefferson County. I've enjoyed my first year on the Board of County Commissioners and looking forward to continuing being uh, the chair for the rest of this year. Uh, we're here tonight to discuss the county's funding challenges, and it's a complicated topic with a lot of different factors and moving parts. For tonight's town hall, we have worked to simplify these factors to really help provide everyone with a better understanding of Jeffco's financial realities. We'll also leave plenty of time for questions so we can hear from you. So press star three to ask a question at any time during tonight's call. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Next, we have Commissioner Leslie Dahlkemper. Commissioner, please introduce yourself. Thanks so much, Roger. Welcome to tonight's town hall. I'm Leslie Dalkemper, and I represent District 3, or South Jeffco. That includes Littleton, Morrison, Conifer, and portions of Lakewood and Evergreen. Before I served on the Board of County Commissioners, I worked as a reporter, owned a small business, and I've served in senior executive roles in both the nonprofit and private sectors. Our family has been very fortunate to call Jefferson County home for 27 years, and it is truly an honor to serve as your county commissioner. For months now, we We've been meeting with members of our community to discuss the county's ongoing financial realities. Your input will help shape difficult decisions as we balance the county budget. And it's important we continue to hear from you to help us understand what your top priorities are. So if you have a question or a comment, please press star three now. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Next, we have Commissioner Tracy, Tracy Kraft Tharp. Commissioner, please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Roger. So um, I'm Tracy Kraftarp, and I'm from District 1, which is the north area of the county. Um, both prior to serving as a county commissioner, I served in the state legislature for eight years. Uh, worked at Family Tree, where I ran the battered women's shelter and the adolescent crisis shelter. So I have a lot of experience running my own business and also working in nonprofits. So as we mentioned, tonight's topic is the county's funding challenges. We are excited to have the county's chief financial officer, Dr. Stephanie Corbo, along with our strategy and budget director, Dan Conway, joining us on tonight's call to help everyone better understand the financial challenges the county is facing. And as your reminder, press star three anytime to ask a question and have your voice heard. Roger. Thank you, Commissioner. So without further delay, let's have Commissioner Kerr start our discussion by providing an overview of the role of a county government, as well as what count the county has done in recent years to slow its spending. Commissioner, go ahead. Thanks, Roger. Before we dive deeper into the county's ongoing uh, funding challenges, I think it's important to start off by explaining the role of a county government to provide better context for tonight's discussion. 
and especially since many people might not be as familiar with county services as they are with state or city governments. So the county really sits between the state and cities in terms of the population it serves. Our primary role is to administer state programs in state mandated services, and that's really why counties are considered an actual extension of the state. So the county provides services that the state or cities don't. In many cases, that means providing municipal type services for people who don't reside, who don't reside in cities, uh, so also known as the unincorporated areas of Jefferson County. Uh, examples of these services include road maintenance and law enforcement. So along with state, city, and county governments, there's also special districts. There are also special districts. Special districts are established to meet specific needs of the community, such as public schools, fire protection, and recreation. While these special districts may serve or overlap in many areas of the county, they they are actual separate entities, and quite often people assume Jefferson County Public Schools are overseen and funded by Jefferson County government, when in fact they are not. The Jeffco Public School District has its own governing board and separate tax authority. So uh, in a similar vein, uh, Jeffco Public Health and the Jefferson County Public Libraries uh, have their own governing boards and do not report directly to the Board of County Commissioners. So what causes some of the confusion is the word county, obviously in these names, and when people pay their property tax, they make one check out to Jefferson County. However, on average, only 24 cents of every property tax dollar collected by the county actually stays with the county to provide the services I mentioned. The other 76 cents of each dollar goes to cities, schools, and other special districts. So with that context in mind, I'd now like to welcome the county's budget director, Dan Conway, to discuss the financial challenges that Jefferson County is facing at this point. So thanks for joining us, Dan. And as I'm sure many of our community members who are listening tonight are aware, the challenges we're facing really aren't new, are they? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Kurt. That's correct. This isn't a new issue for the county, unfortunately. In, in fact, in 2019, a ballot initiative was presented to the voters to address some of the revenue issues the county was and continues to face. However, since that measure did not pass, the county has had to reduce spending in the general fund over the past two years in order to balance the budget. We made $16 million of cuts in 2020, followed by another $8 million of cuts in 2021. These eliminations and reductions have had real-world impacts on the services provided to the community. Yeah, they certainly have. And perhaps the most noticeable cut came in 2020 with the closing of a floor of the jail. I know other reductions included uh, deferred transportation and facility maintenance projects, as well as reduced funding for social services in our road and bridge department. And staffing was also significantly impacted with some positions reduced to part time. New employees were hired at lower salaries, and many vacancies across the county were not filled. So thanks, Dan, for joining us. I know we'll be relying on your expertise plenty more throughout tonight's town hall. So, Roger, this might be a good time to ask our first survey question. Absolutely, Commissioner. Before I do that, let me remind everyone to please press star three if you have a question for our commissioners tonight. Uh, and I know you do, so press star three now. So it's easy to participate in our survey questions tonight. All you have to do is use your telephone keypad to register your response. Here's the question. The county is currently unable to continue to fund a number of services at the current level. Services our residents have said are important to them. If the county was able to acquire more revenue to put towards service, which is a priority for you? Press 1 for transportation infrastructure. Press 2 for public safety. Press 3 for wildfire mitigation. Press 4 for human services like children, youth, family, and adult protection. Press 5 for affordable housing and press six for cybersecurity. And let me repeat those options. One for transportation infrastructure, two for public safety, three for wildlife, wildfire mitigation, four for human services like children, youth, family, and adult protection, five for affordable housing, and six for cybersecurity. Please report, record your vote now. I'll share the results with you in just a moment. And Commissioner Kerr, uh, back to you. 
Great. Thank you, Roger. Uh, so we, we'd like to begin hearing from you on what you've heard so far. So let's take a few questions from the listeners. And as a reminder, you can participate in the discussion by pressing star three on your phone, and you'll be transferred to an operator who will take down some basic information and get you into the queue. That's star three on your phone to ask a question. And um, uh, Roger, yes. Let's hear first from Thomas. Thomas, go ahead. You're live. All right. My question is, since the Taxpayer Bill of Rights increases Jefferson County funding incrementally based on population and inflation, why does Jefferson County need more money? Thomas, this is Jeffco Commissioner Leslie Dalkemper. Thanks so much for your question. Great question. And let's dig a little bit deeper in the formula that Tabor uses. The amount of revenue that can be received each year can only grow according to specific growth factors, depending on the level of government. And those growth factors, you touched on two of them, are different at the state level and at the county level. For the counties, the annual revenue limit is based on the prior year's actual revenue or the prior year's limit, whichever was lower. And it's increased by regional inflation and the value of new local new construction. So those are the two growth factors as opposed to population, which you mentioned, which you certainly see factored into the, the uh, state formula as well. The revenue limit for the state government is based on prior levels increased by statewide inflation and statewide population. For schools, it looks even different. Their limit is increased by regional inflation and local student in enrollment. So you see that these formulas change from governmental entity to governmental entity. Roger, I'll throw it back to you. All right, let's go to Jim next. Jim has a question about inflation and how that's going to impact overall budgets. Jim, go ahead. Yeah, I'm curious about how inflation is going to impact the budget because it's going to be, uh, it's going to hit uh, energy, it's going to hit gasoline, it's going to hit uh, uh, all sorts of other areas, and the budget's kind of like locked in and the revenue stream uh, is established year for, uh, after year. So how are you guys going to deal with this monster inflation issue that's coming down the pike? Great. Thanks, Jim, uh, for that question. And, and you're absolutely right that uh, as, as, uh, as prices go up for, uh, for people living in Jefferson County, it also goes up for Jefferson County government services. Uh, let me uh, turn this uh, back over to Dan Conway, our budget director, uh, to go over a few more specifics. Thank you, Commissioner Kerr, and thank you, Jim, for that question. Uh, you're right. Inflation certainly will be impacting the availability to deliver services to the county. We, we certainly have a fixed amount of revenue that we can work with each year, and with the really high um, historical inflation that we're seeing, uh, we're going to have to identify cost-saving measures and then pursue potentially some revenue sources to hopefully fund those ongoing challenges. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, good question so far. We'll get to some more questions here later in the call. And uh, now I'd like to turn it to, over to Commissioner Dahlkemper, who will continue our discussion. Before I do, here are the results of our first survey question. The question we asked is if the county was able to acquire more revenue to put forward a community service, to put toward community service, which is a priority for you? 18% said transportation infrastructure, 36% said public safety. 23% said wildfire mitigation. Uh, those were the top three. All right. Commissioner, I think you're up next. Go ahead. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Roger. So even though the, the county made a combined $24 million in cuts, that was in 2020 and 2021, and has slowed its spending the past couple of years, we're still facing up to an additional $20 million in cuts to the general fund for 2023. Those are a lot of numbers. Um, but let me explain further that with the exception of the library, the general fund supports every department and elected office in the county. So these cuts will have real world impacts on our community. So one of the questions you may be asking tonight is why is this happening now? And to help answer that question, I'd like to bring back budget director, Dan Conway. Dan, help our listeners understand why we're having to make even more reductions to the general fund right now. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Dahlkemper. 
Well, while these funding challenges for the county aren't really a new development, there was an unforeseen impact to revenue that occurred with the pandemic, further adding to the county's financial challenges. So when the pandemic first hit in 2020, the economy basically shut down, which meant that the county brought in much less revenue than usual. In turn, because there was less revenue, it caused the Tabor formula for our revenue limit to be lower. And that means that the county has much less revenue to work with to maintain existing service levels and to keep up with the growing demands from our increasing population. And with less revenue, many county services are impacted. Essentially, less revenue equals less service. And and when we say less service, we're talking about things like less law enforcement, worsening roads, uh, longer wait times and limited hours for services like the DMV or passports, marriage licenses, permits, and more. Dan, thanks so much for that. You know, you mentioned our Tabor revenue limit is now lower, and as everyone knows, Tabor is a pretty complicated issue, but in order to understand the full scope of the county's financial challenges, we think it's also important to understand what Tabor is, how it works, and how it affects the county's finances. In fact, we already had a a question a little bit earlier from one of our listeners, from Thomas. Some quick background on Tabor, or the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights. It's an amendment to the state's constitution. It was enacted by voters in 1992, and it limits the revenue governments in Colorado can retain and spend. And there are primarily two parts of Tabor. Uh, One, it requires voter approval for new taxes. And two, it limits the growth of government revenue. We touched on that a little bit earlier. Earlier. But, of course, there's even more to it uh, than that, Dan. Do you want to touch on that? Yeah, that's right, Commissioner. As you mentioned, TAPER prohibits tax increases without voter approval. That means if lawmakers or local officials want to implement a new tax or increase an existing tax rate, they must first seek approval from the voters within that taxing jurisdiction. Now, this is the principal function of TABOR, and it really does have broad support among Colorado voters. In addition to prohibiting tax increases without voter approval, TABOR also requires excess revenue to be refunded to taxpayers. Now, if the total revenue collected is more than the TABOR limit, then that excess amount must be refunded to taxpayers the following fiscal year. Great. Thanks so much, Dan, for that explanation. That's really helpful. In in talking about refunds and excess revenue, there's also an important distinction I know that we want to make, which is excess revenue simply means revenue that is above our TABOR cap. It does not mean this revenue is extra or a surplus in any way. In fact, this revenue is essential in supporting county services. But by law, it must be returned. However, TABOR does allow voters to forego refunds of excess revenues if they choose. So that means state and local governments can seek approval from the voters to allow excess revenue to be retained and spent on essential county services. And this action is commonly known as debrucing, referring to Douglas Bruce, the author of the TABOR Amendment. Debrucing is a term used to describe voter approval to allow the state and local governments to keep revenue in excess of the TABOR cap. Uh, Now, remember, TABOR remains in place. That doesn't change, and that's really important to underscore. We're only talking about dollars above the TABOR cap, dollars returned in a check to Jeffco taxpayers last fall. You may remember getting your check in the mail last fall as well. So, all right, I'd like to turn it back over to our moderator, Roger, to take some questions from our listeners. Roger. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Let's do take a few questions. Uh, As a reminder, you can participate in the discussion by pressing star 3 on your phone. You'll be transferred to an operator who will take down some basic information and get you in the queue. So that's star 3 on your phone. And uh, people, uh, we're going to go to Elizabeth first. Elizabeth, go ahead. Hi. um, I'm a a busy mom, and I haven't until recently paid a lot of attention to as much attention as I'd like to the county budget, but over the course of the last six months in just one area of county services, public health, I saw money spent to pay two directors, refurbish a former commercial facility for vaccinations and testing when local, private, and public facilities were already providing those services. The county sued three small public schools with private litigators and paid severance of approximately $90,000 to an employee who resigned. And I'm wondering why you seem to be advocating for citizens to give up more of their TABOR protections when it doesn't seem like the county has been a particularly good steward of money thus far. 
Elizabeth, this is Jeffco Commissioner Leslie Dell Kemper. Thank you so much for sharing those examples and for sharing your concerns. I will tell you that this Board of County Commissioners takes our job as fiscal stewards of taxpayer dollars very seriously. And it's one of the reasons we're talking with you tonight to hear from our community about what priorities you think are most important, not unlike the poll that we touched on just a little bit earlier. We also uh, work with the National Association uh, that I'm going to ask our uh, chief financial officer to touch on, um, the National Association, which looks at transparency. It ensures that we're spending those dollars uh, correctly and accurately. And we have, I think, more than 30 years have gotten top ratings in terms of, uh, is it G-O-F-A? G. Dr. Corpo. Thank you, Commissioner Del Camper. So the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA, um, is the organization that sets best practices and government accounting standards that government entities are required to follow. Um, it would be helpful to understand some specific incidences um, that you feel um, where money wasn't spent well. However, there are specific compliance that has to take place when we do spend our funds. Every year we do go through an annual audit and a single audit for all of the, the federal awards that we receive, and we have different reporting requirements and best practices that we have to follow. And we do follow those, and we do receive the, the financial reporting award every year for, for the past three decades. Thank you for your question. All right, let's hear from Ann next. Ann, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a question about this as well. My property taxes this year, payable as billed by you, were 12.1% higher than last year. I paid 12.1% more than last year. It therefore causes me to question why you're asking for even more. I understand there are limits and caps with Tabor. We've already debriefed West Metro Fire, the library district, um, partially Lakewood. Uh, we've debriefed the education, Jeffco school system. Pretty much everything's been debruced except for county itself, general fund. And again, with a 12.1% increase in my taxes because of exponentially rising home values that are generating enormous amounts of increased revenue to the county without any rate changes, I'm really at a loss to wonder where is that money going? Why do you need more above such increases? Again, 12.1% year over year is, was far higher than the inflation rate last year. So I have a hard time understanding where that money's going. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question, Ann. Uh, that's certainly a, a valid insight into what uh, we're seeing in a lot of the property tax bills. So one of the uh, interesting um, factors when we're looking at our property tax bill is that on average, only about 24 cents of your tax bill stays with the county to provide county services. That other 87, 76 cents will go to the school districts, the cities, and other special districts within uh, the area that you may live. Uh, in fact, typically on a most bill, the larger portion of, of your tax bill will go to the school districts. Uh, and in addition to that, as we touched on a little earlier, even though the property values uh, are going up, because of the Tabor Limit formula, uh, the revenue that it generates uh, pushes us up against that cap. So regardless if they could potentially generate that revenue, uh, that limit does not allow us to retain those dollars to spend for county services. Thank you again for that question. All right. Let's hear next from Jeff. Jeff, go ahead around the performance of our economic development group. Um, I know the portfolio of when we're trying to look at just the taxpayers, people living in uh, private residence or apartments, uh, I know we will struggle, uh, where, whether it's a county or city, uh, to bring in the necessary tax revenues. What are we doing with the economic development? Are we getting a good return on our, on our investment with our economic development group trying to bring in industry or businesses? Thank you. Hi, Jeff. This is Tracy. Thanks for the question. That's a great question. So we work very closely with our Economic Development Corporation, um, which is in the county, has a board of probably the top 50 um, experts throughout the county around economic development. 
and we work closely with them around uh, what's available in the county, what's the labor force in the county, and how can we recruit new businesses. Um, so the Economic Development Corporation has been very successful in bringing in new businesses. So last week I was at a ribbon cutting for a company. I don't know the right way, right way to pronounce it. It looks like Moog, M-O-O-G, but it's Mog, and it's in the city of Arvada. Um, they um, are out of New York. They build satellite parts, and they came to Jefferson County specifically because we have the workforce and we have the labor that they need to be able to um, uh, do their work. So that's a, an example of good, solid jobs um, really helping with the economic development. So, Jeff, I hope that answers your question. Thanks. All right, here we've got an online question that was submitted from Mark. Mark asks, when will you start in-person town hall meetings? Commissioner Kerr? Great. Thanks, Roger, and thanks, Mark, for sending that in. Uh, you're so interested that I see you sent it in twice. That's great. So uh, when will uh, we be starting uh, in-person town halls? Uh, great news. We've actually already started those, and that's uh, some ongoing community budget forums. Uh, we've had two so far, and we have another four coming up. We've designed the this, this six of these in-person uh, community budget uh, forums. Uh, some earlier in the day, some later in the day, and throughout the county so that uh, they can fit in everyone's schedule. Uh, you can find out uh, more about those and also uh, sign up for those. Uh, go to www.jeffco.us backslash funding dash challenges. And for dates, times, and to RSVP, again, that's www.jeffco.us backslash funding dash challenges. And that will take you right to the, the, whole, um, uh, the whole list of them. Thanks for asking that. All right. Thank you. Great questions so far tonight. We'll get back to your questions here shortly. I'm sorry you're getting a little feedback. Uh, I'm going to turn the call over now to Commissioner Kraft Tharp uh, to discuss Tabor a little more. Go ahead, Commissioner. Let's talk Tabor, Roger. Thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. And I'd like to continue our discussion on Tabor and how it impacts the county's reserves or our emergency funds. Along with requiring voter approval for new taxes and limiting the growth of government revenue, Tabor also requires state and local governments to establish and maintain a 3% emergency reserve. This means governments in Colorado must set aside an amount of money in reserves equivalent to 3% of their annual operating costs. This reserve can only be used for declared emergencies like natural disasters or public health pandemics, revenue shortfalls, or changes in the economy do not qualify as an emergency. If this reserve is utilized, it must be restored the following year. Jefferson County's current Tabor Emergency Reserve is approximately $9 million. I now would like to welcome our CFO, Dr. Corbo, to discuss more about the inner workings of Tabor. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Corbo. So one thing that I think is important is to point out about Tabor is that it limits growth and not spending. Do I have that right? That's correct, Commissioner Kraftarp, and thanks for having me here tonight. So the, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, TABOR, is actually a limit on the amount of total revenue that state and local governments may collect. TABOR does not place limits on the amount of money that is spent, budgeted, or appropriated. Essentially, TABOR limits the growth of government spending by establishing limits on the growth of government revenue. So another key component to TABOR is that it establishes different revenue limits for the state government, for local governments, and for school districts. The amount of revenue that can be received each year can only grow according to specific growth factors, depending on that level of government. For counties like Jeffco, the annual revenue limit is based on the prior year's actual revenue or the prior year's limit 
whichever was lower, increased by regional inflation and the value of new construction. So, Dr. Corbo, how does the county revenue limit formula compare to other levels of government? That's a great question, Commissioner. The revenue limit for state government is based on prior levels increased by statewide inflation and statewide population, whereas for schools, their limit is increased by regional inflation and local student enrollment. So as you can see, it's different for every level of government in Colorado. Also, in addition to the year-to-year -year limit on overall revenue, Tabor establishes a specific limit on property tax revenue growth. Here in Jefferson County, the local growth factors fail to keep pace with the demands stemming from the county's growing population. Because the Tabor formula is not tied to that growing population that the county supports, it becomes more difficult to provide needed programs and services and maintain the existing infrastructure we have, like our roads, our bridges, sidewalks, traffic lights, and buildings. This means that Jefferson County continues to have an increasingly larger group of people counting on us to maintain roads and other infrastructure without having the necessary funding to support those sustained increases. Thank you so much for explaining that, Dr. Corbo. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to our moderator, Roger. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Again, as a reminder, press star three to get in the queue to ask a question. I'm gonna turn the call back to Commissioner Kerr for our next topic, which is Tabor's ratcheting down effect. Commissioner Kerr, take it away. Great, thank you. As Roger mentioned, our discussion will now focus on the Tabor ratchet down effect, one of the lesser known effects of the Tabor revenue limit formula. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, the county received much less revenue than usual in 2020 because of the economic shutdown during the first year of the pandemic. This caused the calculation of the county's revenue limit to automatically ratchet down or decrease by $14.5 million. Uh, and, and so basically what that means from that point forward, the county's Tabor revenue limit now grows from that lower starting point. And this is uh, one of those things that's much easier to see on a graph than, than trying to explain it uh, uh, over the phone. But one of the consequences of this ratchet effect is that any revenue that falls above this now suddenly lower threshold must be returned to the taxpayers instead of using it for important county services. And this ratcheted down revenue limit contributes to the ongoing gap between the county's revenue and expenditures. And that gap or deficit has a major impact on the reserves in the county's general fund, which is forced to make up the difference. The problem is this reserve or savings account has reached its minimum threshold and drawing it down any further will affect the county's bond rating and our ability to secure other revenues. So before we dive deeper into what that means for the county and for our residents and businesses, I'd like to turn it over to Roger so we can take more of your questions. Roger. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Actually, why don't we take uh, our second survey question? Again, to participate, all you have to do is use your telephone keypad to enter the number of your response. Here's question number two. Do you think the county should ask voters for funding relief on the, ball on the ballot this fall? Or should the county plan to make up the up to twenty million dollars in cuts projected for twenty twenty three so press one if you think the county should ask for some type of funding relief on the ballot. Press two if you think the county should instead plan to make the twenty million dollars in cuts projected for twenty twenty three to programs and services and press three if you need more information before making a decision. Go ahead and record your vote now we'll share the results with you uh, in just a moment. And while you're voting, we'll take a few more questions and we're going to hear from Leslie first. Leslie, go right ahead. Or I'm sorry, Debbie, go right ahead. Hello. Hi, Deb. Yep, you're live, Debbie. Go ahead. Uh, the part of my question was already answered uh, on a previous person. Um, but why can't we change the language to that taper related to the county so that there wouldn't be that shortfall? And also, uh, our growth is out of control. And 
can we do something about limiting the growth so that there won't be the shortfall in revenue? Thanks so much, Debbie, for your question. Um, really appreciate it. And um, you're right, your original question dovetailed nicely with Anne's. And I have to thank you both for raising it because it is a common question that we get. To your points raised just now, Tabor outlines in state law how much the county's revenue can grow. Now, we could certainly, as you may have heard in the polling questions that came up, turn to you, our, one of our Jeffco voters and other Jeffco voters, to say, uh, would you like the county to hold on to those dollars that are above the Tabor cap? or those dollars that we returned in checks to you last fall. But that would be up to voters to determine. There are other things we could look at. So, for example, state grants also count against our Tabor cap. We're looking at nearly a $1 million uh, state grant to help us with wildfire mitigation, which came in second earlier in our poll. However, that million dollars also counts against our Tabor cap. So if we accept it, we've got to find room somewhere else in the budget. Um, the point is that it is locked into state law, those, those points that you asked about, uh, or the county could also turn to voters and say, can we hold on to the dollars above our Tabor cap through a countywide ballot initiative? Thank you so much for your question. Thank you. Let's hear from Joyce next. Joyce, go ahead. I had... Um... I've had two homes up here in Evergreen and watched all the businesses that we had available leave this area. And police is a joke up here. And I live on Highway 73 now because I lost my home due to the fact that I went next door and saved my neighbor from being killed by someone on a number of different drugs. I was capable of that because I was an RN in psych and I worked with Representative John Whitworth. He was a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I was a lobbyist for nursing. Joyce, I think I, I'm going to have uh, ask Commissioner Kerr to talk a little bit about police coverage and sh the sheriff and how those work together. Um, they did. Joy Joyce, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your inquiry here. And um, I, I too know John Whitworth. I, I worked with him briefly down at the legislature as well as his, his son, Rob, and uh, Dr. Whitworth, John Whitworth, a uh, wonderful person. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you were able to, to work with him and uh, also save your, uh, save your neighbor uh, there. Uh, I, I think the the basis to your question, uh, why doesn't Evergreen have its its own police force, uh, comes down to the the fact that Evergreen is in unincorporated Jefferson County, and for a, a municipality, uh, a city or a town to have its own police force, it has to be incorporated itself. So it has to be its own. Uh, city or town incorporated outside of the county structure. Uh, Ever Evergreen is is still uh, part of unincorporated Jefferson County, uh, so it does not have its own police force. Uh, you're, you're probably aware, uh, living there on Highway 73, that uh, the Jefferson County Sheriff does have their mountain precinct right next to the Evergreen Library. Uh, up, up there uh, on Cub Creek Road, also uh, Highway 73, and uh, and so Evergreen, being a, a population a higher population area of unincorporated Jefferson County, does have its uh, that that mountain precinct. Uh, and at, at some point, if if the people in Evergreen do want to incorporate, they would be able to have their own. Uh, uh, Police force just for uh, Evergreen. Uh, that would that would be a process that uh, they could go through. And again, uh, thank you so much for uh, the service to your neighbors uh, and and for your question. Thank you. 
All right, let's go to an online question from Tina. Tina asks, how much COVID money has or will Jeffco government receive? Uh, we know Jeffco schools receive millions with this additional money. Why do you feel Jeffco needs to obtain additional money from the taxpayers? Hi, Tina. This is Stephanie Corbo. I'm the CFO here at the county, and that is a great question, and thank you so much for bringing that up tonight. Um, we did receive two different federal awards for COVID. The first one um, was in 2020. It was the CARES Act, and that was $101.7 million where we really distribute a lot of emergency relief to businesses um, and individuals within our community, as well as addressing the testing and response to the, the public health emergency. The second federal award was the American Rescue Plan Act. We call it ARPA. And our allocation for that federal award is about $113 million. And it is given to us in two tranches. We did receive half of that, the first tranche, um, last June, so June of 2021. And um, we will receive uh, our second tranche uh, this June. However, the, the federal government is looking at possibly clawing back that county um, second tranche. So we don't know for sure if we're going to receive that. The reason why uh, the federal funds cannot be used uh, to help us with our current ongoing budget shortfall is because they're one-time dollars, and they're meant specifically to help us recover the economy. We could use them one year for a one-year shortfall, but that still does not address the ongoing shortfall that we have um, with our budget. Um, and so the only way we would have a balanced budget is to get additional funding or make drastic cuts. That's a great question, Tina. I want to thank you again for, for asking that, um, and I, I hope that helps answer your question. Stephanie, thank you. Let's go back to Commissioner Dahlkamper to continue our discussion on the county's funding challenges. Commissioner, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Roger. You know, I have a feeling some of you listening might be thinking, okay, so what? The county has made cuts to the general fund, the revenue limit got ratcheted down, and reserves are at their limit. So what does that mean for me and my family? So let's pull all these pieces together. As we mentioned, the general fund continues to experience a gap between revenue growth and the cost to provide services. And this continuing gap is compounded by the ratchet down effect in the Tabor revenue limit, meaning the county has less revenue to work with. And because current revenue levels will now exceed the lower revenue limit, any dollars above that limit must, by law, be refunded to taxpayers. So speaking of refunds, since mailing out the $1.5 million in refunds in November of 2021, last fall, the majority of feedback we received so far has been, why doesn't the county just keep these small checks and use it to help with these funding challenges? It's a great question, and uh, certainly, again, one we get asked often. It's certainly a possibility for refunds in the future, but Tabor requires prior voter approval. We've touched on that a little bit throughout tonight uh, through a countywide ballot measure. Current estimates for these additional refunds in 2022 and 2023 are around 9 to $10 million each year. These Tabor refunds have to be covered somewhere in addition to the continuing gap between revenue and expenditures. So to understand where, I'd like to bring back our budget director, Dan Conway. Dan, can you talk a little bit more about where this money is going to come from? Well, Commissioner, the, the Tabor refunds and the revenue expenditure deficit has to be covered by the general fund reserves. However, as we mentioned, those reserves are rapidly depleting at the rate of up to $20 million each year. So with limited revenues and depleted reserves, the only way the county can balance the budget is to look to spending and make more cuts. As we mentioned earlier, that means that we are looking at a cut of up to $20 million in the general fund to balance the operating budget for 2023. So as a result, programs and services will be cut or service levels will be reduced, and many critical infrastructure projects will continue to be postponed, adding to the already existing backlog of projects, which is quickly approaching $400 million. 
Dan, you mentioned that backlog of infrastructure projects, which has a huge impact on the community. But I also know that the anticipated additional reductions will also continue to impact staffing at the county. And that means we'll continue to fall behind in the job market and our capacity to recruit and retain employers, I'm sorry, employees will only get worse. So in the end, these revenue challenges have consequences on county spending, which in turn have real world impacts to the services provided by the county to our community. Roger, would you share the results um, while we're at it of our second survey question, please? You bet I'd be happy to. The question again was, do you think the county should ask voters for funding relief on the ballot this fall, or should the county make up to $20 million in cuts projected for 2023? Remarkably close uh, answers, 38% of you said uh, the county should ask for some type of ballot of finance funding relief on the ballot. 33% said the county should make the $20 million in cuts projected for 2023. And 29% of you said we need more information. So that's about a third, a third, a third. Uh, let's turn this back. Uh, let's go back to our audience for some more questions. And we're going to go to Jean next. Go ahead, Jean. Hi. Thank you uh, for taking calls, especially if people don't quite agree with what's going on. I appreciate that. I wish uh, Perlmutter would do the same. But anyway, um, the the thing about prisoners, I heard the prisoners were released like in 2020 or 2021. Is that true? And if so, why on earth would they have done something like that? I mean, obviously, the safety of, of their people was not of high importance. I don't know if there was some kind of a political decision made there or what, but it just seems to be like there's a disconnect between the budget of the city and the county compared to the people making these decisions to bring all these people in and pile on people as much as possible. So I, I don't know where the disconnect is, but people have to start working with each other. Great. Uh, thanks, Gene. This is uh, Commissioner Kerr again, and uh, th thank you for your feedback. We're, we're, we're very excited to do these telephone town halls and, and to be opening up for in-person uh, town halls uh, as well. And I know uh, speaking for all three commissioners uh, throughout our, our various uh, elected positions, we've, we've all made a, a, a strong, strong uh, case for, for doing these kinds of, of question and answer uh, sessions so that we can hear from everyone that we represent. And so we, we appreciate that. Um, during the pandemic uh, and, and during the, uh, the budget challenges of the last few years, uh, you did hear me mention that uh, one of the, the ways of uh, cutting back on the budget uh, after uh, the, the 2019 uh, a ballot measure did not pass was to close a, a floor of the jail, and uh, that was that was done in, in consultation with everyone uh, throughout the uh, the county. Um, one of the one of the interesting things around as we're discussing uh, Tabor and, and some of our questions that have been asked about uh, that Tabor does have uh, the the, uh, the formula does have inflation and growth and different levels of government do have uh, uh, different uh, specific formulas. But one thing that Tabor doesn't take into account is, for example, uh, the crime rate and uh, in 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 uh, the latter part of the 20 teens, uh, there were uh, some decreases in, in crime rates, and uh, we it was discovered that uh, there there was not the the jail was not full. I guess uh, would be a, a way of saying it, and that uh, the that floor of the jail could uh, be shut down without putting out too much uh, pressure on uh, the overall uh, public safety uh, here in Jefferson County. Uh, as that happened, uh, COVID did hit, and with COVID, there were some uh, other, other instances where uh, perhaps sentences were, were cut towards the end and, and, and things like that. Overall, public safety was a top priority in, in all of those decisions. And I'm being told that I'm going on a little too long, so I'm going to turn it back to Roger for our next question. 
All right, let's hear next from, oops, I've got my screen in the wrong place. Sam, Sam, next, go ahead. Well, you've kind of answered my question. Um, it, originally, it was uh, uh, in 2020, just how did the pandemic cause you to receive less revenue? Um, I'm assuming that it's because of the businesses that closed. And, you know, now that businesses are starting to reopen, or hopefully, um, is it getting better? Uh, thank you, Sam. This is Dan Conway, the County Budget Director, and a uh, great question. Uh, so really, uh, one thing to keep in mind with county revenue is that we have a broad uh, broad selection of revenue sources. Now, obviously, property taxes is going to be the largest uh, portion that comes to the county uh, for us to provide services. But uh, as uh, we've heard earlier, we also receive a lot of state grants, a lot of federal grants. And then the piece that uh, is also often overlooked is um, the selection of user fees and permits and fines. Uh, that are charged for various functions. And so what we have seen uh, in that first year of the, of the uh, pandemic during the shutdown was that a lot of those other revenue sources dropped off. So as you mentioned, you know, businesses stopped. So uh, just like w with businesses closing down, we had less people coming into the county to leverage those services. So we had less building permits, less marriage licenses, less uh, driver vehicle permits, things like that. We also saw a drop in um, some state revenue coming through as an example called the Highway Users Tax Fund. So as all of us drive around the state and we buy and purchase fuel, uh, the state allots some taxes for that and then uh, divvies up those dollars to the counties. Well, because we had less people on the roads, we had a lot of that revenue drop off. So it was a, a large selection of those options or those various revenues that really kind of dropped off in that first year. Now, hopefully we're seeing our economy bounce back, we should see those revenues come back in. But as we as we mentioned earlier too, because our revenue limit was ratcheted down, we now come from that lower start. So even though our economy is bouncing back at a much more rapid pace, that limit doesn't go back at the same growth rate. So now we're going to be faced with some increased challenges with trying to figure out which revenues we can retain, even though the economy is rebounding pretty quickly. So thank you again for that question. It's fantastic. All right, great questions. Let's uh, go back to Commissioner Kraftarp to kind of wrap this up a little bit and discuss uh, how do we fix our funding challenges here in the county. So the question is, so now what? Thank you, Roger. When addressing the county's funding challenges, both sides of the equation need to be weighed, as we've been talking about, both revenues and expenditures. Jefferson County continues to identify efficiencies. We implement cost-saving measures. As stewards of taxpayer dollars, we always strive to streamline our spending as much as possible, as well as show our due diligence that we're trying to tighten our belts as much as we can. We will continue to critically and strategically evaluate each county department and elected official to see where we can better realign resources to support the services that are most important to the community. So we've updated our budget process to better show where our dollars go so that elected officials can be more informed as they tackle these tough decisions. However, cutting spending alone will not solve the issue. Sustainable revenue solutions also need to be explored and evaluated. These can range from voters permitting the county to retain Tabor refunds to address some of these issues, to voters allowing the county to exclude state revenue from the Tabor revenue cap, as well as a multitude of options that are in between. But remember, keeping these revenues requires prior voter approval and spending reductions will directly impact the level of service to the community. So Roger, this might be a good time to ask our last survey question. Thank you, let's do that. Here's the question, would you vote yes on a ballot measure asking if the county could exclude non-property tax revenue like state grants and user fees from the Tabor formula? Press one if you would vote yes on this ballot measure. Press two if you would vote no on the ballot measure and press three if you need more information before making a decision go ahead and record your vote now and uh, we are going to go back to take some more questions monty is next monty go ahead Hello? monty you're live go ahead 
Okay, thank you. I appreciate having this uh, town hall. It's uh, good to have somebody uh, listen to some input. Uh, I do appreciate it. My question is about fees. Uh, I just happened to, to tag my uh, two vehicles, and when I go through and look at the, at the uh, total bill, just over 10% was uh, taxes, property taxes, owner taxes. The rest of it was fees. And there were a whole list of different kinds of fees. I didn't go look at my uh, my homeowner's property uh, tax bill, but I remember a bunch of fees on that. Can you explain where those fees are being uh, uh, disseminated, where they're going? Uh, that feels like a tax to me, but it's not treated as a tax. Are we just taking the operation budget and splitting it up and passing it on to the taxpayers? What's the What's the approach? Hey, Roger, this is Tracy, County Commissioner. So first of all, it sounds like you know where to find that information, but for uh, the other 3,000 people on this call that might not know how to do that, um, they can um, go to that, um, uh, look in the treasurer's application. So you go to www.jeffco.us backslash treasure, click on the property tax search and online payments button, search your address to see if the full list of what's on your bill so you, kn you know um, what all those fees are. But it sounds like you already know that. So, uh, so Monty, I think what you probably already understand is a fee is something that goes directly towards that service. So if it's for um, a fee on your vehicle tax, that goes directly towards that vehicle tax fund versus um, the county's main source of revenue is property taxes. Property taxes can be go put into the general fund, which can help things like paying salaries, paying for uh, food stamp services for families. So that um, general fund can help in all that way. So that really is the difference. Although I get it, Monty, I know that it doesn't feel that way. A tax is a tax, a fee is a fee, and that's all money that's coming out of your pocket. I understand completely. Dan, did I see you raising your hand? You wanted to ask? Nope, Dan says I got it. Uh, Monty, I hope that answers your question. Thanks for asking it. All right, uh, before we're running almost out of time, before I hand this back to our commissioners to make some final remarks, here are the results of our third survey question. Again, we asked, would you vote yes on a ballot measure asking if the county could exclude non-property tax revenue like state grants and user fees from the Tabor formula? 48% of you said yes, 26% said no, and 27% of you said you needed more information. So we just have a couple minutes left. Commissioner Kerr, do you have some closing remarks? Yes, thank you, Roger, and thank you all for participating in tonight's telephone town hall, whether you asked questions or just listened in. And before we end tonight's call, I'd like to mention how important it is that we hear from our community as we navigate the county's funding challenges and we begin to look towards a possible solution. So we've been actively seeking input from our residents through online surveys, community outreach meetings, and community budget forums. And all of the feedback we've received so far has been invaluable and we'll continue to reach out for your perspective. Commissioner Val Kemper, any final thoughts as we wrap up tonight? Yes, thanks so much, Commissioner Kerr. And again, thanks to all of you for staying on the call with us tonight. If you'd like more information about any aspect of the county budget or funding challenges, please visit our website at www.jeffco.us slash funding dash challenges. And you'll find lots of great information on the website, including a question that came up a little bit earlier that we didn't have time to get to. And that is, where is every taxpayer dollar going in Jefferson County? We have that answer for you because we're, we want to be very transparent and accountable. Go to Jefferson County co jefferson county co.opengov.com and we certainly hope that you're going to join us for one of our in-person community budget meetings thanks so much for being here tonight commissioner Kraftharp, any final thoughts thank you commissioner doll camper you know the final thought that i really want to make is that i don't think we emphasized enough is no decision has been made this is an opportunity to hear from you. And we have our community budget forums in which we're going to different areas around the county to listen, 
to you and to listen what you have to say. So I just want to make sure that you that we emphasize that that no decision has been made. This is our opportunity to be able to hear from you. So if we didn't get to your question tonight, please leave us a voice message. At the end of our call tonight, you will hear a recorded message, and then you can leave your comment or question after the tone, and somebody from our team will get back with you. Thank you, and thanks so much for joining us. All right. Thank you, commissioners. It was a great call tonight, and we appreciate you all joining us for the last hour. We hope you stay safe and healthy and have a very good evening. Good night.